you're so beautiful You're that true And you do it all so natural You're so strong And you show it in it Start my day because I know it's gonna be beautiful like me. Hey, you, you're so beautiful, you're that true, and you do it all so natural. You're so strong, and you show it in. Everybody, and thank you for tuning into this week's edition of Style and Empowerment Chat with Laura and Friends. I thank you for wherever you're tuning in around the world. So, a special hello to all our listeners on Downtown Hot Radio, Take It to the Streets Radio, London Energy Radio, WHTL Urban Radio, FM World Pakistan, The Voice. Uh, so, we're so excited to be here today. Uh, we have an amazing guest coming up uh, in the one o'clock hour. So I'm um, uh, doing a, a, a trial here with us, the stream yard. It's kind of like Zoom. So if you're watching on uh, my Facebook Live, I can see the head count, but I can't see comments. So, you know, share and like and, 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 and spread, uh, spread the joy. Uh, so uh, this past week, um, we lost a pretty major uh, figure in in entertainment uh, broadcasting. So a TV personality and game show host, Richard Philman, passed away. Uh, just like Dick Clark and Johnny Carson, uh, Regis Philman was truly uh, a g- groundbreaker in entertainment broadcasting. Regis Philman holds uh, the Guinness Book World Record for the most hours on television. Uh, Regis Philman started his career in uh, entertainment broadcasting in 1950 when he was a page on the Tonight 
Tonight Show. Uh, so he met Johnny Carson and, and was mentored by him. Um, and of course, uh, he eventually would evolve to be the co-host of the Regis and Kathy Lee Show, uh, which has been a part of uh, the cultural tap pop culture tapestry of morning TV uh, for over 30 years. Um, so Regis and Kathy Lee really were the template for uh, so many uh, journalists and Access Hollywood ET, all, all of these shows and these morning shows. So he was uh, on uh, live with Regis and Kathy Lee from 1980 to 2001. Um, then he, he left and came back in 2011, and then he left again, and then, of course, um, Kelly Ripa um, replaced Kathy Lee, and then uh, Michael Strathairn replaced um Regis, and now it's uh, Ryan Seacrest and, and Kelly Ripa. Uh, uh, but uh, Regis opened up the door for so many uh, morning talk show hosts. He also uh, covered the red carpet of the Emmys. Uh, he, he did a lot of uh, on-the-scenes entertainment journalism as well. And, of course, Regis Philman also had a very distinguished career as a game show host. So, you know, so many of us in media and, and entertainment, uh, you have to have multiple hustles and, and, and diversify. You can't just stick in one lane. So Regis Philman was the original host of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire before uh, Meredith Vieira. And I think he didn't Anthony Anderson take over it for, for a while. Like there's been a number of hosts um, of who wants to be a millionaire, but Regis Philman was the first. Um, and he also uh, was a host of Million Dollar Password and the first season of America's Got Talent. Um, him and his wife, Joy, um, were staples on the New York social scene, um, were good friends with Cindy Adams and... and um, you know, there's so many people in media. So um, Regis, of course, uh, was an award-winning journalist as well. He won five Emmys. Uh, and in 2006, he was inducted into the TV uh, Hall of Fame. And in 2003, uh, he also received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, so uh, we thank Regis for just all the doors he opened um, in his life. And, and and the laughs and you know the careers he, he launched, um, all the prizes and things he gave away through his work and just the joy that he he brought to so many people. Um, so uh, truly, truly, I don't really think that there'll ever be another Regis film, and he he was one of a kind. Uh, so now in other TV news, a uh, TV slash political news. Um, so, uh, civil rights lawyer and uh, MSNBC legal analyst Maya Wiley is leaving MSNBC uh, to run for mayor. So she previously was the chief legal counsel for uh, New York City's current mayor, uh, Bill de Blasio. Uh, so um, she's now uh, moving on to other ventures. Uh, so we're going to take a musical break, and when we come back, we're going to talk all about um, uh, the bullying that was happening uh, on Capitol Hill uh, this week and the courageous um, House representative who was standing up for all women and and uh, Representative uh, Cortez and uh, just really using the experience she experienced to stand up um, for the bullying of women uh, in government and other areas. So keep it locked into Style and Empowerment Chat with Laura and Friends, and we'll be right back after this. <laughs>
you're closer than it seems I know it's kinda hard to keep your head up You're too beautiful, mind full of knowledge Just don't let up, you're fed up, yeah Yeah, I get it, I've been through it before Just know that every loss of faith Always another open door full of Opportunities, humanity, your sanity Get it together, love yourself more than just happily If I showed you I was different, don't be mad at me It's sad to see how women try to unsee actuality So when you fall down, just keep on pushing And when it's hard to see you're a black man, just keep on looking I'm shooking on that, different struggles But we all still feel the same pain It's different sides to a dime, but yet they all change To antisocial just to try and enjoy the name fame They try and doubt you just as soon they hear your name ring Just keep on working, that grind it got them hurting When you hustle, shit don't matter like a concert or a market Too mad to see you eating, not too sad to see you hurting Don't wanna stay up late so you won't go to check Check it early and uh, that's the rules to a queen Yeah, you about your business, give a fuck about what they see Don't tell them about your struggle if they don't know what it means Too good to make a scene, yeah, you a different breed Shine and desire So take 
Empowerment Chat with Lauren Friends Radio. So uh, this week, uh, New York State Representative Alexander Ocasio Cortez um, addressed the House of Representatives uh, and the Senate um, and respond. Of course, um, Cortez is the youngest woman elected into Congress and may uh, be the youngest person to run for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2024. Um, it's rumored that she's going to run. That would be pretty uh-huh. exciting. So, of course, Cortez has um, come out in support of many uh, environmental legislation. She's also in uh, support of Medicare and, and wiping out student loans, uh, So, uh, which is really uh, exciting. So um, we're waiting to see um, if... Um, uh, you know, if that comes into fruition, but or Ortiz, uh, I'm sorry, Cortez, um, uh, uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, um, she addressed the House of Representatives on Thursday in a very empowering and uplifting speech um, in response to uh, two representatives calling her a disgusting. B um, uh, on the on the steps of the Capitol building in front of reporters, and then they later denied it, um, which is crazy. Um, so uh, she addressed uh, bravely addressed uh, uh, the House of Representatives and just called out. Uh, just all the systematic sexism uh, that goes on not only in government but in entertainment in all a- areas of our culture and uh, the fostering of being verbally and and physically abusive to women and uh, in her speech uh, she said this issue is not about one incident it is um, culturally about accepting uh, of the violence and violent language against women and the structure of power in, in our culture that supports it. Uh, so she uh, spoke at length um, in regards to uh, the ways in which uh, these gentlemen insulted her. Uh, many representatives followed her and talked about uh, just how they have, in pursuit of their goals, uh, have been called derogatory words and language. And I think that definitely is an issue that we have to look at. And we've talked about this in many different ways before um, as to why uh, so many men think it's okay to size shame women, to insult them for being intelligent and driven and accomplished if they feel intellectually threatened by a woman. Instead of elevating their game, they'll insult her and try to belittle her and, and, and make her mentally and emotionally feel like she needs to apologize for, for that intelligence, uh, for that ambition. But yet, of course, then, if a woman doesn't appear to be driven enough, men will criticize that as well and say, oh, she's lazy, she's a gold digger, she's a mooch. So I guess the name of the game is be intelligent enough not to make these people feel threatened, but not so intelligent that that you're going to challenge men intellectually and then they're going to lash out at you like children. Um, and, and then encourage other men to gang up and bully, bully you. You know, that's not cool in any regards. Um, we should be supporting each other's gifts and talents and intelligence and, and debating in a respectful way and not a belittling and degrading fashion. Uh, we shouldn't criticize women for feeling good about themselves and having the courage to stand up. That should be something that, that we encourage and applaud. And it's very disconcerting and alarming when you see people, you know, who are in our government, 
elected positions to vote on laws and, and institute a legislation. And basically, these gentlemen are breaking all all labor laws. If you're in the workplace, you can't call your boss a B-word and expect to still have a job. It's not acceptable either if you're a legislator. And how am I going to feel that you're going to represent me as a woman and my interests if you can't treat all women with respect? How can you legally advocate and represent women if you, in your mind, think it's okay to insult women, to, to uh, bully them, to belittle them, and make them feel less than because you're insecure? Um, I, 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 apl- I applaud, applaud rep- uh, Representative for doing this, uh, for 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 standing up, for having the courage, uh, and, and make no mistake, you know what Alexandria did was brave, because a lot of these sexist and emotionally and, and verbally abusive men, they want to fear uh, and still fear in women, not to stand up, not to speak up to just kind of roll over and take it and say, oh, yeah, well, that's part of it. That's part of the business. Like, I hear that a lot. Um, People tell me when I vent and get frustrated about publicists being rude or or guests being rude or people you meet and not following through, not being professional, not respecting your time, your deadlines, your goals, your intent, and just being obnoxious and rude or oftentimes coming at you in in a sexualized way. And then when you vent... People say, well, yeah, but that's just the industry. Oh, yeah, well, that's just, well, that comes with it. No, it's not just anything. It's just wrong. You know, and then and, and it's, it's sad when you have other women because they're just so used to having to deal with inappropriate behavior that when you turn to each other, their advice, well, I have to deal with it too, just take it then it's never going to change. So so you need uh, courageous women like Representative Cortez to call it out and put the mirror up when it happens. Otherwise, it's never going to change. Uh, we, uh, what's the point in, in having all the uh, uh, human rights, civil rights laws? If you think it's okay in a professional setting... To, to call another woman a, a, a bitch because she doesn't agree with your views on, on different things. Are you going to go around like a temperamental child and insult every person who thinks differently than you? The thing is, we're not carbon copies. We're, we're individuals with individual minds and experiences and struggles. So everybody's coming to things from a different perspective because how we're raised, the experiences we have, all these things populate into our viewpoint and what we think is important and what we think isn't. So, uh, you know, I think it is totally, not only is it out of line, but you're, you're, you're losing your legitimacy as, as a legislator. But on the other hand, look at who our president is, who doesn't respect anybody, you know, who, who was on film boasting and joking about grabbing women in the private parts. So on the other hand, how is a legislator going to think, oh, well, you know, I, I don't I, I have to act this way and that way because the president doesn't respect women. The president doesn't respect people's rights or the law, so why should I? So that gets back to also the elections and why it's so important to vote and who you vote for, not only in the presidential election, but in your local and state representatives and judges and district attorneys, uh, you know, not only their voting records, but how they relate as human beings. 
uh, how they carry themselves in a campaign is just as important uh, as what their platform is and the things that they're saying they want to do. If they can't treat their opponents with respect in a debate or in commercials, then how are you gonna, uh, they going to treat people with respect, with opposing points of views once they're in that po- a place of power to advocate uh, uh, and to uh, vote uh, and debate legislation? Because there's multiple parties in our country, and we don't get anywhere by insulting one another and bullying one another uh, when we're voting for for legislation. You know, you you have to, like they say, you know, learn how to play nice with the others. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, do you want somebody in office who's just a hothead and obnoxious and lashing out at people and insulting people on their way to get there? Because that says they're going to be that way, too, once they get there. So how we treat each other matters. You know, accountability, responsibility matters. So hats off to Representative uh, Cortez for just being courageous. And, you know, she pointed out, too, that she's somebody's daughter, someone's sister, and her mother was there. So you were insulting and bullying someone in front of their parents? And come on, that says a lot about you, and it's not, and nothing good. So uh, we're going to take another musical break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to go into our couple news uh, and what's going on in Hollywood and with the Royals and all this good stuff. So keep it locked into Style and Empowerment Chat with Laura and Friends, and we'll be right back after this. <music> I love you, and I love you. See this love that I'm feeling in my heart, well it's undiluted, yeah and it's concentrated, and I want to spread it to everybody.
want you You look like a star You must be famous I need to know who you are I'm a king, so be my queen I never seen you in my city So pro, say, tell me what to do, baby She said, I'm wrong Like there ain't no problem Bowing down at your feet, love Not at all See, I don't mean any hassle Follow me to my castle And we'll toast And break rules like royals do, baby We do what we want, you know what I'm saying? You got miles and miles of beauty So I'ma make you my duty Yeah, does that sound as good as you look? You look mighty good I'm a king, so be my queen I never seen you in my city So pro, see, tell me what to do, baby. She said, I'm wrong. Empowerment Chat with Lauren Friends Radio. So, a couple news. Uh, this is kind of interesting. So, Tom and Rita Hanks just became Greek citizens. So, apparently, in January, uh, the president made uh, them honorary Greek citizens. Um, and uh, Rita is Greek, and uh, the Hanks have vacation homes in, in Greece that they uh, uh, visit uh, throughout the year. Uh, of course, the Hanks were in the news for uh, uh, coming down with COVID in March and apparently have um, have recovered. But then there was also rumors that they were among the celebrities that were involved in the sex trafficking uh, uh, scandal. Um, and so some people are speculating that maybe that's actually true and that, uh, that they're planning to move to Greece to evade authorities. Uh, so who knows uh, what that. There, there's so many rumors and things going around right now with Oprah and all these uh, Illuminati-like people and stuff. Uh, like, look, is there, is there videos? Is there paperwork? Is there testimony? Is there formal charges? Until then, it's just all hearsay. So it's not clear whether or not they're continuing their citizenship with the U.S. as well. I'm not sure if Greece is one of the countries where you can have dual citizenship. Um, So now, in baby news, Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner uh, welcomed their first child uh, this weekend. They haven't released uh, the name or gender, but they're quite excited about that. 
And, uh, of course, Demi Lovato seems to have finally found love and, and grounding and happiness. Uh, of course, uh, uh, she, years ago, was dating Wilmer Valderrama and and a bunch of other Hollywood guys. And, of course, uh, had been in and out of rehab and has been very open with her struggle with self-worth and, and anxiety and depression, which are things that that many of us uh, deal with Um, and she used to cut herself and she's really put herself out there to try and help other people through her journeys Uh, so her boyfriend who I actually wasn't wasn't uh, really familiar with but when I went and looked, oh, he's an actor. He has a bit of a following. So she's been dating this gentleman by the name of Max Urich, who's a, a singer, actor. And she released uh, pictures and some video uh, of the proposal and just uh, talked at length just about how happy and grateful she is that she found quality love in her life and she spoke a lot about her spirituality and her relationship with God which has been a pivotal pillar of her dealing with a lot of her demons and and, and struggles and whatnot and and she was, went on to say that for the first time she really feels that she's being loved in a healthy way and just feels good about herself. And and so I'm really excited to see that. And she's so talented and has such an amazing voice. Um, so uh, I'm just really happy to to see, see her happy. I'm sure she's going to make a beautiful bride and it's going to be an amazing wedding. And so now in other couple news um so kim kardashian and kanye uh, continued to be in the headlines this week uh so of course shortly after his outburst at a presidential uh, stop in which he was saying that harriet tubman uh, didn't actually free slaves. She she sold uh, slaves to whites to continue to be in slavery, and he just was saying all this outlandish stuff. And then later, he was tweeting all this stuff in his Twitter, which later got removed, calling his his wife and mother in law white supremacists, and uh, they're divorcing, and people are trying to trap him and lock him up, and just all this stuff. And of course. Um, Kanye came out a few years ago saying that he was bipolar and things escalated to a point where Kim actually came out on her social media the other day asking for people to uh, give them privacy and understanding and that, you know, talking from the perspective of someone who has uh, someone with mental illness in their family, she was going on to say that, you know, it's a struggle where you're powerless and and you you have to wait for the person who is sick to want help and you know she basically was just asking people to give her and her family privacy as they deal with this and so her and Kanye um, met uh, in a parking lot near their ranch in Wyoming where Kanye apparently has been staying for the past couple weeks and he was saying that he wanted to divorce her she was saying publicly that she'll continue to stand by him and you know that they're trying to keep things private for the children and so they met and apparently you know god forbid the press give them privacy uh kim was crying and with this and that and stuff but then on the other hand um she does film a reality show so so i'm thinking could this also be for plots and views and this and that? Um, because both of them are known to have created big propaganda <laughs> things in the past. So who knows? I, I mean, it is established that Kanye does have various issues. And I just hope that he gets the help that he needs. And I feel bad for the kids because they're just caught in all this turmoil, you know. And and they, they it's not not easy for kids 
to see their parents dragged through the headlines um, and dealing with all this. So, um, you know, I, I hope that he gets the help uh, that he needs. Um, you know, I... I, I hope so, uh, uh, because n nobody, nobody, um, at least if you're a, a caring and kind person, nobody wants to see uh, other people be dragged through a mock, you know, when uh, when they're in pain and turmoil. Uh, that's that's not a good thing, you know. Um, and we just need to be caring and understanding. Um, of people and just not not so judgmental. Um, speaking of judgmentalness, um, I you know I had had this this topic pop off on my thread and I got kind of annoyed when I when I saw it. Um, so uh, this uh, one person on my Facebook page had started this conversation asking if women prefer to be called um, plus size, BBW, full figured, this, that, and the other thing. And, and I'm like, what? I'm like, why are you fixating on, on women and, and their bodies and, and, and labeling them? Within interaction, I you know I hate that. Like, why do you? Why is this even an issue? Why are you addressing somebody by their body shape and your perception of it? Um, my name is Laura. That's how I like to be addressed, or or, or Miss Masaryk. Um, or friend, or you know, so, something complimentary. I don't want to be addressed by an adjective, and, and so, uh, and then that, that's a hop, skip, and a jump to people bullying one another. And I really just don't understand this mentality, especially as you're getting to know one another. I don't understand this mentality that you have to address people by categories uh, and this mentality of just putting people in a box. Uh, I don't get it. You know, why, why can't we just uh, relate to people in a respectful manner and not call them, oh, you're this, and and you're that, or I like this kind of person, I like that kind of person. How about you? Just, hey, I like you, it's nice to meet you, let's get to know one another. And, and address people in a respectful way. Um, and then, of course, the, then that welcomes all this back and forth debate on, oh, well, what's considered plus size? What's this? What's big? Be, be, and, and all this nonsense, you know? I, I, I think we need to really stop looking at ways to put each other in a box right. a, 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 and a label and a category. And instead, let's just look at each other as human beings and focus on what our commonalities are and get to know one another. Uh, and, uh, because, too, to me, when you, you're focused on labeling, it, that's a divisive mentality. That's a separatist mentality. And we aren't going to get anywhere in life uh, un unless we're looking at each other as human beings, respecting one another, and in an inclusive and understanding mindset. Um, so on that note, we're going to take another musical break. Um, when we come back, uh, we're going to uh, be interviewing one of my role models, amazing woman, uh, a broadcaster, just all-around phenomenal woman, uh, journalist Lisa Thomas-Laurie. So keep it locked in to Style and Empowerment Chat with Laura and Friends, and we'll be right back after this.
goodbye And I've been holding everything inside But now I've got nothing left to hide Well, I'm with you Oh, you But I can see How strong a man I'm gonna have to be To do for you it comes so naturally So will you move And all I want Is a chance to prove So all I can do I believe in starting over I can see that your heart is true I believe in good things coming back to you You're the light that lifts me higher So glad you got me through I believe in you of a man was to never cry work till you're tired got to provide always be the rock for my fam protect them by all means and give you the things that you need baby our relationship is suffering trying to give you what i never had you say i don't know how to love you babe well i say show me the way i keep my feelings deep inside i channel them with my pride I, i'm trying desperately baby Just work with like me love. Show me the way to surrender my, my heart. heart Girl, I'm so lost yeah. Teach me how to love yeah. How I can get my emotions involved yeah. Teach me Show me how, how to love. love Show me the way to surrender my heart, my heart. Girl, I'm so lost love. Teach me how, how to love Emotions involved yeah. Teach me oh. How to love I was always taught to be strong Never let them think you care at all Let no one get close to me Before you and me I didn't share things with your girl About my past That I'd never tell To anyone else Just keep it to myself Girl, I know I lack a 
affection and expressing my feelings It took me a minute to come and admit this But see I'm really trying to change now Wanna love you better, show me how I'm trying desperately, baby, please work on me Show me the way to surrender My heart, girl, I'm so
Empowerment Chat with Laura and Friends Radio is thrilled to welcome iconic, award-winning, groundbreaking a TV journalist Lisa Thomas Laurie. Style and Empowerment Chat with Laura and Friends Radio is thrilled to welcome iconic, award-winning, groundbreaking a TV journalist Lisa Thomas Laurie, who over her 33-year career with Channel 6 ABC has set the bar of excellence that everyone in journalism strives to reach. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you better now. I am fantastic. It's such a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be invited on the show. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, Lisa Thomas Laurie, of course, is uh, just such a legend in the Philadelphia broadcasting community. 33, well, actually, what, 38 years? uh, You were. Wow, can you believe it? I'm sure it seems like a flash. Oh, gosh. You know, sometimes, Laura, I came at 78. I was 23 years old, and I tell you, sometimes it's like yesterday, and sometimes it just seems so long ago. (laughs) Right, right? I think around the time I retired is when it hit me that it had been just about almost four decades. Wow. And then I just, just, you know, it doesn't seem like a job or, or anything difficult when you love it so, and you're enjoying yourself, and I mean, Philadelphia was meant for me to be because Philadelphia has embraced me. And I am so indebted to all our viewers who just went through everything, you know, with me personally, professionally, just picked me up and just made it a wonderful place to be. And of course, the, the station itself and being partnered in the beginning with Jim O'Brien was what's better than that. <laughs> it was fantastic, and and uh, of course you uh, initially were uh, correct. You were a weather girl first. Yes, 
before you became a news anchor? Yes, a lot of us, a lot of us women were, and you said it right, we were weather girls, weather gals, but we weren't meteorologists back in the day. <laughs> right, right, right. In the, in the 70s, right. In fact, I could, I, I, I could tell you a little funny story. I was, I had a grant to, when I was in Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. And um, my grant ran out after my first semester, uh, freshman year. And an uh, upperclassman friend of mine upper class of students said, look, they're, they're hiring a new weather girl at the NBC affiliate down in um, Huntington proper, and I think you'd be great. You should go down there and audition. Well, I wanted to be a magazine writer. I, hadn't, I didn't, didn't know anything about TV, and I needed a job to stay, stay in school, so I went down, auditioned, learned, learned the map real quick, became the help, learned the United States map, and I got the job, weekend weather girl, for three and a half years at uh, WTBY Channel 8 in Huntington. And, uh, and, and I remember at one point, after I was a weather girl, they had an internship open my senior year to do the news. And I thought, wow, I, I think I'd like that better. So I tried that out. It worked pretty well. And then they sent me to um, a, 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 a forum, some type of forum. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was for weather girls. And they sent me over to a station in Kentucky. And I met this lovely blonde lady who's just a little bit older than me. I want to say four or five years. And she was giving me some insight into the business because she was, she'd been a weather girl and she was anchoring. And her name was Diane Sawyer. Wow. And so, <laughs> Barbara Walters started as a weather girl. Is she? Okay. You're, you're telling me something I wasn't sure of. Yeah. So that was the, you know, the FCC was cracking down. The Federal Communications Commission was cracking down on stations to, to hire uh, minorities and to hire women. And I was a double minority. So I had that experience that was considered gold back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, um, uh, of course, in college, um, uh, you became a friend in passing um, with another broadcasting icon, Oprah Winfrey. Yes, I did, you know. Well, it wasn't in college really. It was, it was in the Right. Right. Seventy. I want to say this was seventy-five or seventy-six. Mm -hmm. And so I was really hoping I would meet her when I went in the next day. And sure enough, she's sitting over in the corner, and I go over to tell her how much I enjoyed her newscast because she was she struck you, you know, mm -hmm. um, her voice. She was so confident, and that's when she said, you know, what's your name? And I said, my name is Lisa Howard. I was Lisa Howard. <laughs> That's so amazing. And, of course, you, you two were both up for the same position at Channel 6 back in the day. You know, I did not know that until three years after it happened. 
but when I found out, I when I came to Channel 6, very soon after I arrived, I was designated the Oprah reporter. When oh. she, when her show was syndicated and she went national. Right. She came to all the big cities to, to promote it. And uh, because I had to have a connection with her and knew her, they had me on with another reporter who had worked with her named Terry Martin. Some of our viewers will, will remember him as a one-time anchor of a news show at Channel 6, a reporter. But Harry and I were on it, just chatting about our experience with her. She had just done the color purple. And so she had Harpo, the young man who played Harpo. Yes. On, and we, we just chatted and talked. And she, you got to remember that one thing that stands out, Laura, about that meeting with Oprah, she was in love. She had just met Stedman. Ah. Uh, she was telling me about this tall, handsome guy, and she, told, she was just very smitten with him. And, you know, the rest is history, but she, um, when I went up to do whatever I was doing at her station, I would always go up maybe once a year at least mm -hmm. and do a story at Harpo uh, about the, 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 the main operation in Chicago. <laughs> We would always share stories, and uh, I know I came up one time, and she brought out the thank you note that I had sent her when I came for my interview, or you know, for her hospitality, letting me come, asking me to come to her apartment and stay. And Aww. just a real, real down to earth person. But I think you know, she. I remember her asking me, you know, what do you want to do? What, where would you like to be in New York or whatever? And she she wanted to go to Philly, and I found out that, like I said, late. And we just sort of kept it under our hats. We just never talked about it. But when I retired, she revealed that, you know, you know, I wanted to come to Philadelphia, and Philadelphia chose you. And so I went on to Chicago, and that, instead of Lisa Thomas Lori retires and inquire the next day, the, the headline was, Lisa beat out Oprah for the Channel 6 job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, can you just imagine, had had Oprah come to Philly, there never would have been the Oprah Winfrey show, and who knows, her, her film production company and all the things that she's done since might not have happened, and the different celebrities' wow. careers she launched, you, you right. know? Uh, well, you never know. Maybe she would have. I guess you just don't know. You just don't know. <laughs> her, when, she, when she was an anchor in Baltimore, that didn't work out. And so the whole talk show thing with Oprah started in Baltimore when she was demoted. Mm. But she was demoted because the, the anchor man that she was working with didn't like her, didn't want to anchor with her. Uh, I think the news director, she would admit to me, she said, you know, I'm not cut out for this anchor job because I get too emotional when they're a sad story. Yes. So when, when they demoted her and put her, I can't even think of the man's name, who was, who was doing the talk show, <laughs> it was like magic. Mm. You know, they, she was wonderful. So then the bear, she was hired in Phil Chicago. Donahue. She the filling was... job. She was hired in Chicago to do her own show. Yeah, it was Phil Donahue that she... Well, was, yeah. Yes. Phil yes. So, so he, she was replacing him as the Chicago uh, time slot because she, uh, she initially just started out in that market, and, right. and much, awesome. much like Visions or FYI Philly. But then it right. grew in popularity and then became nationally syndicated. So, so initially she was uh, basically replacing Phil Donahue. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, she, wasn't, she was doing a show before that that would, uh, was just a magic. Mm -hmm. AM Philadelphia, when Dave Roberts and Claire, and I can't think of Claire, Claire Carter maybe, I can't mm -hmm. think of her name. So imagine, she's a local talk show host in Chicago, and the local show is getting, getting better ratings than Phil Donahue. Right. So, Phil's almost ready to retire. <laughs> so what are they going to do? They see a star. Yeah. 
I remember telling her, I said, you're, you're just phenomenal. I just, I think you're headed to great places. And so one day she said to me, well, well what do you want to do, Lisa Howard? She always called me Lisa Howard, even though they changed my name when I came to Philly. And I said, I want a family. I want my career and a family. And she would always tell me, good luck with that. <laughs> right. Well, of course. It worked out pretty well. So, being being a, a woman in broadcasting, which has a lot of demands, uh, time wise, and can also be stressful, um, h- how did you successfully balance being a news anchor a- and a mother uh, all at one time? Well, you know there were challenges, Laura. It, it wasn't easy, mm-hmm. and I realized early on that. I really wanted to be, uh, I wanted to have a husband, I wanted to have children, and I wanted to be fair to them. Right. And at one point, early in my career here, I was prepared to give it up if things hadn't worked out. I was fortunate enough to be at a station like Channel 6, mm-hmm. where we were so far ahead of the ratings that I could... I could structure my own schedule to some degree. Oh, that's great. Yeah, after gaining some popularity, I asked to not do the um, the noon show. Um, I do remember, unfortunately, our dear General Bryan passed away in a skydiving Mm -hmm. accident, and so I I took over his position. And by the fact, I was doing Mm -hmm. the noon at five for a while. And when I had my second child, my second son, I said, look, I'd really like to give up the news show and have more time with, with my boys and just do the five. And luckily I was in a position where our ratings were really good and they didn't want to mm-hmm. lose me. And so that's what I did. I just did the five o'clock for a long time and I would do special reports. I still wanted, uh, you know, I, I still wanted to do good television. Mm-hmm involved, but it wasn't always easy. It was a big juggling act. <laughs> right. Now, you um, were, uh, came into 6ABC, uh, as you said earlier, at a time when there really wasn't a lot of uh, female reporters in prominent anchor positions or minority reporters as well. So can you talk to us a bit about what that climate was like um, as a woman trying to carve out your niche and get respect, um, what that journey was like and, and, you know, fighting for the top stories and, and all that? Well, I tell you, you know, being a woman of color in Philadelphia was a, a, a special during, during the early, well, late 70s, mm-hmm. it was a special challenge because if you go back to when Oprah Winfrey came to audition for that new show, and then I came, I think, a month or two later. Mm-hmm. The person who you would think would get that job would be the more experienced person who had done some anchoring. <laughs> I had never anchored before. Wow. And Oprah and I were discussed this. We knew what was going on. But back then, when the FCC was, was challenging stations and saying higher minorities, mm-hmm. there were some stations that were, I'll go ahead and say, there were many stations who were reluctant to make changes. Mm-hmm. You know, their audiences, and especially in Philadelphia, Channel 6 had a beloved uh, news team. And uh, the powers that be were very reluctant to change that. Um, when you look at race relations right. in Philadelphia, I'm sure they were a little nervous about bringing someone of color on the scene. And, and I knew early on that one reason for my appeal was that I didn't look too black. And, and that, that sounds harsh, Laura, but it was a huge reality. Mm-hmm. It was the reality at the time. And so then you start to realize, wow, wow, that's why Oprah didn't get it, because they're worried that the audience, the black viewers would accept her, but what about our long, loyal white viewers? 
are they ready in South Philadelphia, in certain areas of Philadelphia, for a black anchor? Mm -hmm. So, you know, understandably, they had to be a little concerned about that. And when I came, I, I don't have any doubt that, that um, African American uh, viewers knew that I was of color. Right. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Yeah, I had to, I had to go back and I said, look, you know, this is, this is the deal. But I'm sure I was a safe event back then. And, and it was a good thing for both of us because look where Oprah ended up, my goodness. You know, this phenomenal media powerhouse. And I was very happy with what I was doing, you know. Mm -hmm. I, was just one of, I was the top local station in the country great career and I was able to have that family that I wanted you know so dearly but sure race relations and race had a lot to do with it back then and um, I just had to stay true to myself mm -hmm. you know that's what I tried to do all along I tried to do stories that made a difference for women and for black women and black people and I you know I did the, the hard news but I always preferred to do stories that, um, and especially after I became ill, mm -hmm. stories of people overcoming obstacles. Human and, interest stories. Yes, yes, and I was given the go-ahead, the green light to do that when I came back. I was mainly reporting, still in anchoring after mm -hmm. Channel 6 was wonderful enough to keep the door open for me. And I was out almost three years with an illness that went undiagnosed for such a long time mm -hmm. and was very, very serious. So, um, I, 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 um, I feel very grateful and very lucky to have been at Channel 6 and had the support that I did. Well, it was a good ride. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, you, as uh, uh, picking up on what you just said, you open up the door for not only women in the Philadelphia broadcasting market, but also women of color. Um, but we still don't see the level, uh, at least in my opinion, of equal diversity um, in the, well, everywhere, but specifically in, in news. Uh, I feel we don't see enough diversity in, in our anchors. Uh, I mean, we've made steps forward, but I feel we still have a long way to go. Well, you know, that, you know, I mean, we, there's been such a, a change since I was hired as an anchor, because, you know, I wasn't the first. A lot of people right, exactly. Saw many people watch Channel 6, but many people remember Beverly Williams. Mm -hmm. She was there before me, and she was the only one at her station. Yeah. And there were, there were others who followed but when I look at our station now, and all the wonderful young black women who are mm -hmm. anchors and hard news reporters, um, that's just amazing. That's, that's such progress. But yeah, you know, it, it remains to be seen who will replace Jim Gardner. Right. You know, our main anchor, our patriarch. Yes. Uh, I don't know if we'll have to make that decision, or I should say they will have to make that decision. Yeah. Really soon because he's going to work there and they're going to have to carry him out kicking and screaming. I think he's going to work as long as he can. But, yeah. Well, you know, who will, who will replace him? A white anchor? A, a, a black man? A woman? Mm -hmm. So that, that, you know, we'll, just, we'll see how much progress we've made. Well, but, uh, we, we, we've come a long way. Now, um, in Philadelphia, I always say either you're a Channel 6 household, you're a CBS, or you're a Fox. I was always ra I was raised on Channel 6. And like you said, I mean, one of the things that always um, uh, just gravitated me towards Channel 6, not only was the quality reporting, but just the clear humanity and just warm per and engaging personalities of the anchors. And you've... you've 
you feel like as a viewer, like family and, you know, you bond with your family growing up, uh, watch, mm -hmm. watching, uh, and you like time caps. Oh, do you remember this? And do you remember that? And wrap mm -hmm. around and visions and this and that and that story and so forth. Um, now during your, uh, 30 plus uh, year career with Channel 6, you covered many, many um, very important stories um, like um, the move uh, riot, you um, uh, covered the Democratic National Convention. Uh, I remember just personally sharing a memory of mine, um, which I, I'm so excited to talk to you about this. Another woman that I, I admire greatly is Princess Diana, and I remember when I was nine years old, cutting school to watch the live broadcast um, of, Chan <laughs> <laughs> of Prince Charles and Diana. I actually pretended that I got on the school bus, and I circled back, and I was so excited that my favorite reporter, Lisa Thomas Laurie, was going to be reporting, and I remember sitting up against the TV. At that time, it wasn't a digital TV, you know, the kind you turn with the knob and just looking at it with amazement and wonder at, at, at the, all the pomp and circumstance. So can you just talk a bit about that experience, what it was, uh, yeah. what that was like, and also I'm sure fighting behind the scenes to get the get. I'm sorry, the last thing you said was also... Um, also, um, the behind the scenes of fighting to get that coveted assignment. Yes, 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 yes. Well, you know, um, the news director at the time was Alan Desmond, and it, it wasn't such a competition. I okay. was fortunate because I had recently been married, and so when the, the, the Princess Diana, uh, Prince Charles story came up, he thought I was a natural fit mm -hmm. as a newlywed to go cover that, and that was my first international story. So I was both a little nervous and so excited to, to go to London, and we had a great crew. Uh, executive producer Cheryl Fair was there, and one of my favorite cameramen, Bob Pruitt, and, oh gosh, he's a wonderful editor who left Channel 6 before we did, but I can't think of his name, but anyway, we had a great team, and I just, uh, I just loved it. Now, the challenge was that, you know, there's, there's five hours different time zone different right so we were working around the clock to because they wanted a story for every newscast wow luckily we didn't have as many newscasts then that we have now <laughs> right <laughs> but, but yeah but for the morning the noon the five o'clock the six o'clock and the 11 they wanted a story wow so, so you're there reporting and editing and submitting all day long Yes, we, we worked all day long, and we were there uh, a whole week. We had one free day at the end of everything. But the stories were so exciting and, you know, so in, intriguing. And I know the one that I wanted to do on my own was the fact was a little controversial in that Diana had refused to obey. She was not going to say she obeyed her husband. That was a big deal back then. So I said, I really want to do that. That's, you know, that's important. So we, we did do that, and the local singing group, the Three Degrees, you know, who I was familiar with, was there, because that happened to be Prince Charles' favorite singing group. Really? And yeah, they were there. They had they had been asked to come to do one of the pre-wedding galas to sing and perform. I got to meet them at their hotel, and one of them wasn't there, Valerie. I can't think of her last name now, but she was pregnant with twins. So she wasn't there, so I met with two degrees, two of the two degrees. <laughs> and it was just such a fun time, um, as well as challenging. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I looked up on that as um, just one of my favorite stories of all time. And I remember, I probably would have covered the death. Uh, I, was, I was on vacation down in Ocean City, Maryland, when the news came in that she had been killed in a mm -hmm. car accident so many years later. And Monica went to cover that. But and afterwards, I said, you know, I'm glad I covered the seemingly happy time mm -hmm. and not 
the, the, the tragedy, but... And, and was, literally... I, uh, I think I, I was amazed by how many people viewed it. I just, everywhere, people go, I got up, I set my alarm for I think it was five in the morning here. Yes, but, yes, literally. The actual wedding. Uh, and I remember just the crowds and and uh, people hanging out of their windows just to get a glimpse. Yeah. And, and she, I ran into so many people from the Delaware Valley. They, you know, I remember my news director saying to, to Cheryl and I, "Please try to find some locals. Try to find some people from Philly." Well, it wasn't <laughs> hard. Everywhere, every corner we turned, there was somebody from the Delaware Valley. Wow, so camping out. <laughs> or, you know, just just doing something, making sure they were going to be there for this fantastic event. And I remember what a phenomenon that moment was with the merchandising and calendars and mugs yeah. and, and and that truly was a, a pop culture moment in time. Right, yeah. I got a few little knickknacks to bring back. Some of, <laughs> some of the memorabilia, you talk about the merchandising, and uh, some of it was so tacky. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and some of it, it didn't even look like them. Uh, no. oh, we okay. tried to capture that in some of the stories to have fun with it. <laughs> I think I brought, back, I brought back a trash can with their picture on it, <laughs> and some little goblins. One, one that I remember was a, a, a tippling stick. It was a little cane, and you screwed the top of the cane off so you could sipple. You could put your alcoholic beverage in there, <laughs> walk down the street, and just have a little shot when you wanted. <laughs> well, yeah, then one of those, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, now you also interviewed President Reagan and covered the Democratic uh, Convention. So, of course, um, you know, in yeah. media, we're supposed to uh, stay objective and not be part of the story. Uh, but especially right now, of course, with everything going on, it, it's, it's hard to, if you're a hu- caring human being, not to want to kind of jump in. And I'm sure, like, you experienced this, like what you were saying about Oprah, where she felt that the anchor role wasn't for her because she'd get emotionally involved in the stories. Right. So, so right. Uh, and you covered so many, so many stories, you know, happy and sad. And and right. I'm sure that, that stirred up many emotions. So can you talk to me a bit about how you would uh, keep that objectivity? You know, not not uh, incorporate maybe your personal opinion and views and what people are doing, but still have your your um, viewpoint as a reporter, uh, right. right? And walking that line, right. Well, I, I don't remember having a lot of difficulty maintaining my objectivity. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you what turned me off, and I knew I would have to do you know, murders and carjacking yeah. and yeah. fires and arson. But when I was in Nashville, one of the early stories I did was um, a real tragedy. Uh, it involved uh, a woman who had a daycare center for little kids in her home. And she had, as far as everyone knew, the proper licensing. Mm-hmm. And I believe she had about 14 kids. Mm-hmm. It seemed like a lot to me, but she she was following regulations. But there was a, there had been a horrible accident where um, a, a chimney collapsed wow. on several of the kids who had managed to work their way inside it, playing. She could not have the proper um, blockage for the chimney area and one one little girl died and I we were in the area getting ready to do another story my photographer and myself and we were killed to go to the scene and when I got there it was so fresh and so new that the parents weren't there yet and they were just you know the, the uh, owner mm-hmm. of the facility the little nursery facility was just just you know horrified and Destroyed, and they had just put the little girl's body in an ambulance, and uh, the you know police and medics and everyone were on the scene. But I was being encouraged 
by uh, my assignment editor then in Nashville that, you know, as soon as the parents get there, get an interview, get an interview, get an interview. Mm. And when the parents arrived, they were so distraught. They were so confused. They, I, I'm not even sure if they knew that, that their child had passed. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I could see myself doing was sticking a microphone in their face. Right. So I didn't. I chose not to. I interviewed. I got all the facts I could get. I knew what hospital the child was going to. I knew the circumstances surrounding what happened. And I showed the parents. I told my photographer to show the parents from a distance. Mm. But I couldn't feel that I could stick a microphone in their face. Yeah. And, of course, on the news that evening, other reporters, they didn't get a comment, but they were trying. Right. And I, I was um, reprimanded for not trying. Mm. And I gave my position. You know, I told my news director, yeah. I said, I just didn't feel comfortable. You know, sometimes I feel you have to put yourself in the shoes of other people. Exactly. Said, what, what did they gain? And as it turned out, a lot of viewers complained about the reporters who did try to just bombard the parents, covering them with questions. And mm-hmm. it came off it came off as being totally insensitive yes. and rude. So I didn't no one said to me, We're glad you did what you did or no one said to me, You were right. right. We were wrong. But I wasn't bothered about that anymore. Mm-hmm. And I and I still got difficult stories, and I just, you know, they, I weighed them individually as to who I felt comfortable interviewing and who I didn't. And but it it it, it made me uh, not want to do as many because yeah. I felt like we had so an overabundance of negative news. I would hear it everywhere. Mm-hmm. And later, later in life, later in my career, when I was sidelined, I would see it from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. So I always felt like there was that unbalance. Yeah. And I always wanted to do positive things. I always thought people wanted that. Even though I was being told at the time that people like to see people doing worse than themselves. I never bought into that. Like, Me I neither. Think, yeah, I think people want to see some good things every now and then. So, and people yeah. overcoming obstacles and still hoping and... Yeah. And, and and stories that make you believe and aspire that things can be better. And, and uh, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, in my own way, that's something that I, I've had to find my own moral compass in what we do. Because you, you, there's, I feel there's a fine line between reporting and exploiting. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you think about it, when you deliver, it used to be that, and I remember this when I was sitting at home trying to figure out my illness and Mm -hmm. watching news, that was my different perspective. And I would say, my goodness, the whole first block, first eight minutes of our newscast was either murder, Mm -hmm. kidnapping, arson fire, something bad, something negative. And I said, you know, your feature stories are left at the end of the newscast. Hmm. And sometimes they still are today, but at least, um, when I came back to my own in 2007, I think what I had on my side was the fact that we were in an economic slump. Right. You know, and I think that the, 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 our managers and our news directors were seeing that people were having enough of the negative things. They needed something to lift them. Right. So I was given the go ahead to to do feature stories. I said, you know, and I was, luckily, fortunately, I was in a place where I could say, uh, you know, I don't need to come back if I'm going to have to do murders and mm-hmm. do stories again. So it caught on. It became very positive. I remember one of the first stories I did was about a young black teenager in Camden who was basically homeless. You know, he would live at a friend's house like, for a week. He would with a distant cousin. He really didn't have uh, parents who were taking care of him. He had um, he had uh, grown out of the foster care system because I think he was 18. And he was smart and just 
keen beyond anybody's wildest imaginations during during uh, school. Mm-hmm. And he had been accepted to every Ivy League school. Eight of them, I think there are. Yeah. He, had, he had been accepted to every Ivy League college. And that story got a lot of response because mm. most of the stories you would hear out of Camden would be horrible. Right, murders, robbery, rapes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I started doing those stories, and, and there were plenty of them to do. And um, and now you see, you know, you, you see the other states started doing them locally. But you look at World News Tonight with um, I almost said Peter Jennings, and that really dates me, doesn't it? Right. But David Muir. Yes. He, he has in every newscast with the person of the week, leaving you with uplifting thought in the yeah. newscast After, especially now during COVID and mm-hmm. the presidency and our, our government you know do we, do we need some positive news we yeah we do. need lots of positive news uh, no, I just wanted to uh, touch on, um, you uh, mentioned your your illness, um, uh, poems, is, and our listeners may not know, you, I mean, Bea, I said this to you off the air, but now I'm saying this on the air, not only are you just an inspiration and role model of excellence within broadcasting and media, but you are such a fearless and courageous, amazing woman. Uh, Our listeners might not know, but Lisa uh, had two bone marrow transplants. Um, Your your vocal cords were paralyzed at one point. Um, I imagine the rehab uh, of that was long and arduous and scary. You know, if your main way that you reach people and your craft is using your voice, I can only imagine just how scary and upsetting and depressing that that would be like singers who who they get nodules and they can't sing anymore or or they go deaf and they can't can't sing you know Uh, yeah Mm -hmm. it's interesting that you you compare it to a singer because the 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 doctor that discovered that i had a paralyzed vocal cords was a doctor who used to a doctor um Saddle off was his name. He said mm-hmm. past. But his office was with downtown, and I was having trouble projecting my voice, you know. And uh, my uh, Dr. William Lewis at Lankanov sent me to him uh, because I, I couldn't speak loudly. I mm-hmm. couldn't project my voice like I needed to on the air. Nobody seemed to know why. So when I went to the ENT, he said, I've got this wonderful doctor. He treats opera singers. Wow. Yeah. He's known for, for treating opera singers, and and he should be able to figure things out. He said, well, you have a you have a uh, paralyzed vocal cord, your left vocal cord. And, and, and it was the disease, you know. It had affected my nerves um, outwardly, and it was getting into my internal organs. And it, this was, I guess, the first year and a year for less than two years into my illness. And it, it, it ended up paralyzing my vagus nerve in my stomach so that I wasn't digesting food properly. Yeah. I look back on that, oh my gosh, I look back on that and it was, it was something that, I don't want to say I accepted it because there were times when I was scared to death. And I know the people who loved me, my family, my husband, Mm-hmm. You know, I tried to, uh, one, one of my sons was at Brown and at school, but Leland especially was here, still in high school, and I didn't want him to worry, I didn't want to go to him, but the only thing I can say about that, um, Laura, was my mother. She laid a foundation, a spiritual foundation for me, and she was a devout Catholic, and she raised me and my brothers Catholic. I didn't follow Catholicism after I became an adult, neither did my brothers. But that spiritual foundation was there. Mm-hmm. You know, we knew there was something 
someone greater than ourselves. I believed in God. My brothers believed in God. And I think, I, I, I often think of, um, oh gosh, I know I'm going to get forgetful here, but I'm thinking of uh, James Baldwin's book, um, The Evidence of Things Unseen. You know, that's what faith is. Mm-hmm. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And I just always, naturally, instinctively, had faith that things would work out the way they were supposed to work mm-hmm. out. That my husband was a doctor, and we thought we were answering, uh, asking the right question. Mm-hmm. And we asked a lot of questions. Could we have asked more? Probably. But in the book that I ended up writing, that's what I try to share with people. Some of the things you can do to navigate this crazy health system of ours, mm-hmm. if you become sick and there's no immediate diagnosis, you know, not to be afraid to go to a different doctor, not just twice, three, four, five, mm-hmm. however many times you need to change doctors. Advocate for yourself. Yeah, exactly. Be an advocate for your illness. And that's the best thing I learned. But that faith just kept me going. Mm-hmm. I remember being shocked after I had my first bone marrow transplant after we had finally found out what this thing was. And I ended up going to the uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, mm-hmm. Minnesota. A wonderful doctor here. Uh, Dr. Newman. Dr. Gary Newman was my gastroenterologist. Wow. What I was suffering from was something hematological. You know, and but he noticed because I was in the emergency room so much for, for gastritis, uh, mm. the different stomach issues. He said, you know, I, I don't think that this is what you have, what your doctors are following here. Mm-hmm. I, know, I know a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. She's been studying things that are more related to your illness. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna get, I think you should go out there so we did and we got the right answers. But um, it, 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 it was hard to get there. Yeah, and all, and, and I, all I can think of were, were, were those people, people who didn't have those the resources I had. Mm-hmm. Yes, how, how they how they would fall. And it could be so stressful and exhausting just trying to hunt out what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, right. what, what right. tests and doctors are going to give me answers. And the other thing is that can be frustrating is when doctors just think in a very one-dimensional textbook way. Because yes. so many illnesses overlap each other in symptoms. And then yeah. once you figure out what the illness is, oftentimes there's hybrids of that illness uh, that don't uh, strictly follow textbooks. And there's so many doctors right. out there who it's almost like they go to a checklist. Has this, has doesn't have this, doesn't have that, has this, but can't possibly then have this because they don't have uh, like three and four. But you right. very you very well might actually have that, you know. Exactly. So finding the right doctor who not only has the right bedside manner and medical knowledge, but also uh, looks at things from a humanistic angle, not just what's on paper, to find exactly. the answer. Right, and sometimes you know it's a combination of doctors. But mm-hmm. it's funny there was a there was a doctor here that had given me the right diagnosis. Mm-hmm. It was a strange, so almost cruel twist of fate for me in the beginning, because a, a doctor who taught my husband at, at Jefferson, mm-hmm. he was his mentor. This was a, a black doctor who was chief of neurology at Lankanal Hospital. Mm-hmm. And his name was Edgar Kenton. He has since passed. But he said, when I first went to him, he thought I had this rare condition called poem syndrome. Poem, like the line in poem. Mm-hmm. This was an a, a acronym. Each letter stood for one of the symptoms that I either had or would get. And we followed that, but the thing was, Dr. Kenton was getting ready to leave the Philadelphia area and leave Lincoln Hall. And um, moved to Morehouse to do medical research down mm-hmm. in Atlanta. And he had referred me to a doctor at uh, John Hopkins who was who specialized in poem syndrome. 
And he, as a hematologist, because this was a blood disease, this was a plasma cell, dysplasia mm-hmm. disease, and not an autoimmune disease like a lot of doctors thought I had, I, I followed this doctor, John Hopkins, and a doctor, and a hematologist that I saw. And they, they said, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll work up, we'll work you up for this poems. But after about a month and a half, they dismissed the poems. Mm-hmm. They said that my symptoms were more in line with something called CIDP. And it was wrong. Wow. It was not, and it was, it was clear that it was wrong. Bill and I kept asking them to visit, revisit, revisit the mm-hmm. poems. We never got that off out of our mind. Mm. And sure enough, two and a half years later, we go to the uh, Mayo Clinic. And um, the doctor deduces there that I had the poems all along. And, you know, it kind of, I had some permanent damage. And it's frustrating and validating at the same time. You know, you're yeah. frustrated that you had the answer to begin with and lost the time, but validated yeah. that they finally agree, yeah, this is what's wrong. Now let's get a game plan. Right. Well, her game plan was immediate, and I had that bone marrow transplant, mm. which was pretty drastic at the time, but yeah. darn, darn, it didn't work. And, you know, because this is, this is, the poem is, it stands for polyneuropathy, which was my first symptom. Mm-hmm. We all was for organomegaly, which is enlarged organs. At the time, I didn't have an enlarged organ that I developed, because wow. it took so long to get a definite diagnosis, something that the dollar doctors would follow. I developed an enlarged liver. The E was for the endocrine, uh, endocrine system. I developed hyperthyroidism. Wow. The M was the blood aspect, monoclonal gammopathy. And that's what should have been the ha-ha moment for them. Mm-hmm. Because the, C, the, the CIDP that they thought I had, what the monoclonal gammopathy showed was that my platelets were off the chart. A normal person has about 250 to 400 platelets. I had one for And that doesn't happen in a person with CIDP. Mm-hmm. And then the S for poems was skin changes. My skin had turned a strange bluish gray color. Oh, wow. Especially, especially in my ankles where, you know, my nerves were being affected and in my hands and wrists. Mm-hmm. So, with all of that information, you know, even when I went to them, I had three out of the, the, the five symptoms, and then I would get them all. But um, by the time I got to the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Dispensieri, I called her Dr. D. Mm. She just came in, and, you know, I'd had a week of tests there, and she said, look, you, you have poem. It is shutting you down, and you need a bone marrow transplant. Stat. Wow. The problem... I was too weak. She said, we got to get you a little stronger. And you go home. She built up my pulmonary system, the breathing. Gave me a special diet with better nutrients. And I came back two months later and had it. Maybe for my 50th birthday. Wow. But, um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a smoldering myeloma. Hmm. It's a precancerous condition. So... Yeah. You know, it it it, um, it lies dormant for a while. It goes into a sort of remission. There's no cure. So eight years later, when the symptoms started showing again, they tried me on some new drugs that, mm. that they developed, and I just didn't tolerate them well. Oral chemotherapy drugs, and I asked for another transplant. Wow. So I, I did that in 2015. Retired the next year, but. I'm just really watching my diet this year and hoping they come up with something in the next, you know, what is it, the five years? So hopefully in the next two or three they'll come up with something. So I won't have to get a third. Right. Oh, no. Mm. But, uh, I, you know, it's taught me so much. You know, what they say. I used to hear people with, who were, you know, terminally ill or very ill say, you know, that, that this disease has made me stronger. It, it's so true. You know, it changes your perspective on life. And I just, you know, if it was meant for me to suffer through something, I, you know, you want to learn from it. And I think mm-hmm. I just learned and gained so much appreciation for my life and my family and friends that it, that was my course to take. And, and, and I have no complaints. 
and I'm so much better now. Do I have physical limitations? Yes. You know, I do. And I, I just forage through them. I mm-hmm. used to have to wear a leg brace. And when, I, when I first got the transplant, I was in a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. But uh, I probably should wear my leg braces more because I'm mm-hmm. just a little off now. But, <laughs> but, yeah, but I'm, I'm alive and I'm happy and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay productive and just, you know, I'd never plan to write a book. I have to give my younger son credit here. He would just bug me, Laura. He would, <laughs> he would say, Mom, when are you going to write your book? He's the one that thought I should write a book. And I took notes all through my ordeal and sometimes mm-hmm. he would have fun because he's the one that took after me. He's a writer and Mm-hmm. You know, he, he likes, he, he's a people person more so than my older son. Mm-hmm. And he would always read it, Mom, you gotta write a book. And mm-hmm. I, at the time, just viewed this little boy, my youngest, my baby, <laughs> as not a repeat. You know, he thinks it's cool to write a book. Well, one day, he sat, we were sitting watching television, and he said, Mom, I don't think you're taking me seriously. <laughs> he said, Why aren't you gonna write? Why aren't you starting your book? I said, I don't know. I don't want to dredge up all those bad memories. He yeah. Said, Mom, you know how many people you would help. And when he said that, I saw it so differently. I said, he really wants me to help people. Do you know he found my publisher? Wow. And had a publisher. So your son was like your agent. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Now, if our listeners want to pick up your book, yeah. um, What's the name of your book, and where can they find it? Well, the book is on camera and off when the news is good and when it's not. <laughs> and it's on Amazon. Uh, you can also find it at Edward Jutkowitz. He's the publisher mm-hmm. um, in, in, in Philly, downtown Philly, Edward mm-hmm. Jutkowitz. Camino Books. So and- Another Camino books, but it's it's um it's on it's on Amazon, and I think they just restocked because they were getting a little bit low. Awesome, fortunate to say. <laughs> now, uh, of her many many accomplishments, Lisa Thomas Laurie also has several doctorates. Um, you've toured the country, uh, motivational speaking, and and uh, your book tour. Uh, you were honored uh, also by the Pennsylvania Association of Black Journalists here in Philadelphia. Of all your accomplishments, which have been many, can you say some of the things that you feel have meant m- the most to you? That meant the most to me. Oh, gosh, they're so uh, I'm so appreciative of, of all the recognition, and but when you know what when when I when I did write the book, and I do want to say that the, the proceeds go to the the uh, Mayo Clinic research for um, for Collins research because so mm-hmm. much has happened with that when so many doctors were not aware of what Collins was, mm-hmm. and now in Philadelphia. There are divisions at Jefferson Hospital and Penn, and there are special, you know, um, uh, doctors who talk about dealing with poems. Because you have to imagine when when I when I went to Dr. D at the um, Mayo Clinic, I think she had thirty other patients with poems diagnosed with poems, just thirty. And mm-hmm. she dealt with patients. She wrote the standard of care for poems. Wow. That I know there are so many more patients who've been misdiagnosed who are out there and just don't know they have it. Mm. So now that that is so true. These many years later, what was that 2004? So now, 16 years later, hospitals and doctors are are knowledgeable and, and know about it and mm. know how to fight it. But I'm so um, gratified when someone comes up to me and says, you know. You, you changed my life or you helped me find the right diagnosis or you helped me get a handle on, on what I'm dealing with mm-hmm. and with the motivational speaking in the, in the book you know I just try to answer those questions like I said to navigate the mm-hmm. health system which can be so overwhelming 
to ask the right questions, to know who to go to, to, to know what certain diseases are and how they're categorized. And, mm-hmm. and, and having the courage the to advocates. ask, too. You know, I said, and also having the courage to ask the the, the hard yeah. questions to your doctor, yeah. and and I just kind of getting swept under the rug in an appointment. So that's right. a, another important thing, and where you truly are a role model to others, of just standing firm in your quest for for the right di- diagnosis. You know, asking those questions, and and not just being. Uh, complacent in what is said to you. Exactly. And it's hard, you know, especially I think about the elderly who might live alone or, or, mm-hmm. or sometimes staying with family and they're busy with their lives. And so I'm telling you, it was so confusing mm-hmm. because people ask, well, why, why did it take you so long? And I used to be embarrassed that mm-hmm. as an educated woman married to a doctor, we couldn't find the answer faster than two and a half years. Wow. But they put you on medication. Mm-hmm. In my case, I was on prednisone, which is mm-hmm. steroid, mm-hmm. which often masked the symptoms. Right. Sometimes the steroids they had me on, I thought I was getting better. Sometimes I didn't. So, you know, they want to they wanna use a certain treatment. I was, I was given a treatment of plasma for rhesus, which mm-hmm. is a cleansing of your blood. Wow. And these doctors had me convinced that cleansing my blood would take out the bad antibody. Mm. They were replacing it with a synthetic albumin. And sometimes I would feel better, but sometimes I would be sick as a dog. Wow. Now, as the disease progressed, and it was soon as it started entering my internal organ, like with the, by the time I got that diagnosis from Dr. Settleoff, that my vocal cord had paralyzed. That's when I, Bill and I got more aggressive, saying, mm-hmm. this is not the IDP. Right. This is something else going on here. And I, I remember being really stunned that after it was all over and I was getting better, Bill confided in me that he didn't think I was going to make it. Yeah. I said, what? And I was, I, he said, Lisa, you were so sick. And he said, we weren't getting, we didn't, we didn't know we were getting the right answers, and then we figured we probably weren't. And we didn't mm-hmm. know where to go for them. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Newman had sent us to this wonderful doctor who got it right and um, got me the right treatment. And it, it, and it just so happened more that the treatment for poem uh, less than a year prior to my illness mm-hmm. was radiation. Wow. And the death rate was so much higher. She had written the standard of care for poem, but it also determined that the bone marrow transplant would handle it, would just like it does some uh, cancer patients. The bone marrow was a better treatment. So I was really in the right place at the right time, and that, that faith carried me through. Mm-hmm. And just not giving up, you know, and yeah. literally fighting, fighting, you know, fighting for your life, fighting for answers. Just, just keep, uh, keep pushing. Exactly. That, that's my advice. You know, and if you, you know your body, and even if you're given medication that, that's confusing you about symptoms, you know, mm-hmm. the, you will know if things are right or not. And that's why it's so important to ask questions and to ask questions of different doctors. There's a doctor here, and she's at Hop, Dr. Hyman, Terry Hyman Patterson. She was, she was my favorite grace in a lot of ways because when the other doctors were insisting, Stay three months longer with the CIDP. She was really leaning toward the poem. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because at the time she had another well known patient. Um, he was the center, uh, Todd McCullough. Mm-hmm. He was the center for the 76ers. And I don't think he played more than a couple months here because he developed these strange symptoms in his feet. And that's where mine started. And so someone put me in touch with him because they thought, they wrote an article in the newspaper that we had the same disease. And he had been told he had CIDP, and I was told I had CIDP. And he was such a nice guy. He came over, we went to visit him and his wife, and they were, they were uh, leery of the diagnosis as well. What, I, I share his story in the book because it's 
showed twice that doctors could get it wrong and you just have to be diligent and ask the right question. He found out that he had something called Charcot Marie Tooth System. Wow. That named after the two doctors who discovered it and it ended his basketball career. But he's out west somewhere, I think he's yeah, Arizona and he's doing well. He, he does um he does conventions with <laughs> pinball machines. <laughs> he took that up because he always you know, a hobby. Right. Pinball. And is doing really well with it. <laughs> but yeah, he had um, they had they had us having the same disease as Dr. Um, Hyman Patterson. Wow. Interviewed took the, took the, what happened? His mother came to visit, and while his mother was here, she had a bout with her feet. Oh, so wow. she, um, yeah, she she examined her and discovered there was a strange curvature in their feet that was wow. causing them not to be able to move and especially not to run as Todd needed to do at the center for a basketball team. And discovered that not only did he have this illness with his mother mm -hmm. and uh, got it right. Mm -hmm. So it, it just shows you. No. But the... Uh, the power of prayer. Also. Yes. Boy, did I learn the value of power of prayer. Yeah. Prayer, um, faith, when, and when I came back, I, I would go out on stories. And I was, you know, my thing was, was my profession. I always loved recording more than anchoring. Mm. So when I, people were saying to me, oh, wow, how are you going to be not being able to sit behind the desk? I said, are you kidding me? I love recording. So I would go out. I'm telling you, there was not one day that someone could come out of their house or their office or whoever I was interviewing. Someone would say to me, we prayed for you. And I, I realized that that was the catalyst that probably led me to all of these things that made a mm. difference. This power of prayer. And I, my mother was always a big believer. And I, I saw it in real time. I saw it happening, you know. The fact that all these things, people, they were right and have me on their mass list at church and their prayer list and a mass is set for me. And I, I thought it was nice at the, at the time, but then I realized that I think it, I think it took more than just a you nice know, treat. I think it really made a difference. Well, you certainly, Lisa, have made a difference. I can speak, in, you know, in my life and the life of so, so many people in our community. Um, I, I just thank you for all the the impact you've had in my life and just oh, the, just being the amazing powerhouse, super Shira woman that you are. Um, so as we close out, can you just uh, leave our listeners, our, uh, particularly our female listeners, just some advice on how to keep your integrity and and your voice and your viewpoint in entertainment, in media, and uh, just, you know, f uh, find your path and integrity? You know, I have to go back to my deep feelings of being true to yourself, mm -hmm. you know. Be the person you are. I know as a young person, when I was 23, coming to the big city <laughs> in Philadelphia from all the little stations I had been at, I, I was quite intimidated, as you might imagine. Yes. But uh, my, my mother and my father had always said, they, no, don't do anything that you're not comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't underestimate yourself. Yes. You know, you can, you can, whatever you don't know, you can find out. Mm -hmm. You know, and I tell young people, be true to yourself, you know, do the work, put in the work. And I also tell young people to read. I didn't really like politics coming mm -hmm. into the business, but mm -hmm. I knew that's something I would need to know something more about. Right. So I would read everything I could get my hands on, you know, about not just who I might be covering in the near future or someone assigned me to, but just in general, mm -hmm. things that I didn't, things that I didn't necessarily gravitate towards, geography and the, the state of the world, what was happening in other governments, other countries, and 
mm-hmm. politics and how the United States got to this point in its history. Those things are so important that I was just addicted to, to, to reading. And, um, and, and just remembering who I was as a, as a person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how you would want to be treated. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. That's my mom right there, you know, those are her words. And that's what she always taught me, you know, just treat people the way you would want to be treated. I think I that's have, the most important way yeah, to, to yeah. walk through life is treating people the way you would want to be treated. Exactly, exactly. Well, it has been a delight talking with you, Laura. You make, it seem, you make me feel so comfortable. It's so easy. It's just like a long-time friend chatting on an afternoon. Hopefully we can do it again with... Have tea or <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Well, I feel the the same way. I feel like we're a long time friends that just finally, finally got to meet. Truly, I, I have to say uh, there have been so many interviews that I because I am so proud, and this was so important. But really, you were a building block for me and everything that wow. I, I I have done in this lane. So it is beyond an honor to not only be able to speak with you form a friendship hear all your reflections and wisdom uh, and I, I'd say the words thank you were just too small for uh, what, what I'm feeling uh, right now oh thank you God bless you you know what I don't go into any situation where I don't learn something too and this is no different you know I find that when I'm, I'm asked to come and do a motivational talk or whatever asked to come on your show, I always am inspired, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm always uplifted. So it, it, it's a win-win. Mm-hmm. And I so appreciate that. I so appreciate you reaching out to me. Of course. Well, to share my story. Well, you've left us with so many inspiring and uplifting thoughts and perspectives. Everybody go out and get Lisa Thomas Laurie's book. It's amazing, just like she is. Uh, and so we'll be back next week with more Style and Empowerment Chat with Laura and Friends Radio. Of course, you can catch us on Downtown Hot, London Energy, Evermore, Pakistan, The Voice, and Take It to the Streets Radio, as well as iHeart, Speaker, Stitcher, Google Podcast. Cass Alexa, all, all your favorite places. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and have an empowered and uplifting day. Thanks, you too. Have a wonderful day. I'll be in touch. Go all right. All right, bye-bye.